Oh, that's good. Amen. That's the first time I've heard that organ in some time. So good. <coughs> if God gives you a gift, I think you should use it. Oh, yeah. Over 40 years ago, along with some men, we drove out to uh, uh, off, off of Alcoa Highway and went to a home. This lady was losing her sight. She was going blind, and she couldn't play the organ anymore. So we bought that organ, and we carried it over here, and we put it in. And uh, it's been there since then. So that's the history behind that organ. And it sounded good tonight. Amen. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 1, verse 27. If you go to verse number 26 to get the context... The scripture says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Father, bless this book now. In your holy name. Amen. As I told you before, angels were not created in the image of God. So who's he talking to? You see? This is the Trinity. This is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost in the act of creation said, let us make man in our image. Man's made in the image of God. And so we find when he made the man, he put him in the garden to dress it and keep it. He didn't put him there to just sit around, you know, pine away. So he gave them something useful to do, but he sinned. When he did, he was expelled from the garden and a cherubim with a flaming sword was placed at the tree of life, lest he eat of that tree and live forever in that fallen state. God showing his mercy and his long suffering and his graciousness all the way back there. So this is the first uh, relationship that God had with man, was an in innocency. Now when the man sinned, as Satan said, the day you eat this, he said, you'll be as God, knowing good and evil, and they did. So therefore, they came under conscience. And I'm going to try to give you tonight a little bit about how to study the Bible. I believe it will be a great help to you because I'll show you some of the things I got into and where God brought me out of it and gave me some wisdom in how to deal with some of these issues. So many people, they say, Preacher, the Bible is such a, for one thing, huge book with so many things in it. How in the world do you study the Bible? Where do you start? You see, well, that's a good question. No question about it. It's a good question. Because you want to, the Scripture commands you. Study to show thyself approved to God. So that's a good question. Where do you start? When I started studying the Word of God, I had about 15 or 20 translations piled up around me. I wanted to make sure that I got exactly what God had said. I didn't know the difference between uh, Aleph or uh, Alpha. I didn't know any of that, none whatsoever. But I wanted to learn. And so I started down the path of many translations. It didn't take me long to find out the Lord had his way of showing me that I only needed one. And that's the AV 1611. That's the one I've got today, and I stick with it. It's the one I believe. Uh, if, you want to, if you go to my office, I can show you all kinds of translations. Uh, believe me, I've got plenty of them. But I only believe one. See, that's the difference. And, uh, but anyway, I, I studied the Bible, and uh, God began to open Scripture to me. He will reward you if you will study it, if you will put some time and effort into it. Uh, I look on YouTube, and there's quite a few places on there where it says, uh, learn the Bible in 30 minutes. No, forget it. And he's playing with you. That's clickbait, as we call it. Uh, oh, how many know what clickbait is? Uh, those of you that surf the web, you know what it is. That's garbage. 
You're not going to learn the Bible in 30 minutes. Oh, no, no, you're not going to do it. You're not going to, you're not going to master the Bible in 30 years. Uh, no, the Word of God is alive. And I'll show you that part in a moment. But when they passed from innocency, they passed into the state of conscience. And so their conscience became their guide. And, but that didn't last long. Uh, didn't last long at all. They wound up uh, calling themselves by the name of the Lord, it says, over there in the book of Genesis. Then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. And uh, that's uh, one of those things where they had, uh, they had confused the identity of Almighty God with angels that had come down from heaven that left their first estate in Genesis chapter number 6 and came and cohabited with women. These are the great... Uh, 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 what do you call them in Greek culture and Greek, uh, the Greek gods, the titans and so forth, uh, the men of renown, but we know them as fallen angels. And as they did that once before, they'll do it again. And we may very well be seeing the fruit of it right now. But in any event, they fail. They fail. They fail first with innocency, then with conscience. God set them up with human government and he said, gave them the bow. He gave them the sign of the, tr of the, of the bow uh, outside, you know, when it rains, uh, the uh, beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. I've, I've seen two rainbows at one time in the sky, and I thought that was quite, quite uh, remarkable. But the rainbow is a sign of God's covenant with man. He'll never destroy the earth with water again. Led all the way up to Nimrod in the Tower of Babel. And here human government led them, led them to a point of universal rebellion against God because they were going to build a tower into the heavens that they might be able to touch. I'm not sure what they intended to touch, but they were going to get as high as they possibly could into the heavens. But that failed, and God reached down into Ur of the Chaldees, and he called a man by the name of Abraham. Abram was his name at the time. Father means father. Then he added the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, hey, and it became Avraham, Abraham. And now he becomes high father. And he's the father of many nations. He's the father that the promise would come through. He's the father that uh, would show us that faith is how you talk to God and live for him. And God blessed him. And his people were led off into captivity, though, into Egyptian captivity. And they were there for 400 years. And then at the end of that period of time, this time of promise that God had given to Abraham came to a screeching halt. And they were led out of Egyptian bondage and out at Sinai, they allowed themselves, or even asked, to be brought under the condemnation of the law. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal were the two mountains used for God uh, to read the blessings and the cursings of the law. And they said, all that God hath said, we will do. And so they attempted to do that. But it quickly brought you down to Luke chapter 16, verse 16. And here's what I want to read for you this morning, because or this evening. This is the kind of thing that helps you study the Bible. In Luke chapter 16 and verse number 16. Now look carefully at it. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Now this is a definite dividing line. This is the end of one period and the beginning of another. And notice carefully, the law was given at Sinai all the way from Sinai to John the Baptist who preached the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. The law was preached. And here the Bible says in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist. We're talking about a dispensation, a period of time. But since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Now turn to the book of Matthew chapter 11 with me tonight and verse number 12. Now I'm going to show you a principle of the Bible that will help you understand it and help you to study it because it's important. If you get this part about the Word of God, it'll help you immensely. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. See this? Were there any prophets after John the Baptist? Oh, yeah. Agabus, thus saith the Holy Ghost. In the book of Acts, oh yes, prophets still came. But we're talking about the end of the period or the dispensation of the prophets and the law. But it didn't mean it was the end of God's relationship with man. Because in Matthew chapter number 11 and verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now look at verse 14. 
And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, let's see what, that, what he's quoting. Look at Malachi chapter number 4 and verse number 5. This is Elijah, or Elias, which was for to come. What do you mean, preacher? The Lord Jesus just told them that I'm going to show you a conditional thing. Depending on which choice you make will determine which direction that the dispensation moves into the future. Basically, that's what he said. So in Malachi chapter number 4 and verse number 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, see this, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, see that, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now look carefully at what we're reading. The Old Testament finishes and ends with God promising to send Elijah. The New Testament opens with John the Baptist preaching and the Lord Jesus says, this is Elijah if you'll accept him. What you don't find is any mention of the church. It's nowhere to be found here. What you do find is God dealing with the children of Israel, with the people of Israel, with the Jewish people. In plain words, everything that happens to the Gentile is based upon what the Jew does. <laughs> Digest that for a moment. It's not that the Gentile comes first. The Jew comes first. And what the Jew does determines what God does and when and where and how he does it with the Gentiles. So obviously we have a situation that is conditional showing up with the ministry of John the Baptist where Israel could have accepted their Messiah and it had been a different situation entirely as it has been. It has developed into what we know now and that's the best way I know to put it. It has developed into 2,000 years of the ministry of the body of Christ and what we call the age of grace. And of course, grace has been with us all the way from the beginning. Without the grace of God, nobody could ever be saved. But we generally refer to it as the age of grace and the throne of grace and the period of time where Jew or Gentile, bond or free, red, yellow, black or white, makes no difference. They're all, uh, the invitation goes forth to all men that they can be born of the Spirit of God and the Jew is not elevated to the number one position. He's not first. Right now, it is the body of Christ, but it didn't have to be that way. And so this is what's important about studying the Bible. This is a conditional thing. When you come to the book of Acts and you find that uh, on, the day of, uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down in fire, tongues of fire over the heads of 16 different nationalities speaking in different languages and fills them with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, literally a tornado, a hurricane moves in their midst we find the conditional situation with God rising again. For the second time, he is offering the kingdom to the Jew, and he offers it to them specifically. Had they accepted that, the church age as you know it now would never have existed. That's two conditional things right there. Now, if you get these things right, it'll open the Bible up to you. For example... The Lord Jesus is coming back. Amen. 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 So when is he coming back? Well, the son doesn't even know because he chooses not to know. Well, then who knows? The father. Has he set it in stone? In plainer words, do we know from Scripture the exact time that the Lord is going to come back? It's not set in stone. It's a conditional thing. And that's the best way to understand it. Conditional. That for at any time, the Lord can bring back the Lord Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the tribulation period can start and he can catch up the body of Christ to be with him in the clouds. Nothing has to happen tonight. No signs, nothing has to be fulfilled for him to come and get his body, his bride, the church. At any moment, he can come and get us and take us away to be with him because we are not looking at the day of the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, he talks about the day of Christ. Now here's what happens in the new Bibles. If you've got the NIV or some of these other new Bibles, they confound the day of Christ with the day of the Lord. They confuse you. And why do they do that? Because the Greek text is not kurios. Hemera, kuri, hemera is Greek for day. Kurios is Lord. 
The Greek text is Hemera Christos, which is Christ. In other words, the day of Christ. So they intentionally change that word from Christ to Lord. And that confuses people. Because to put the day of the Lord in context, you're looking at Elijah coming back. And you're looking at the church. Not church, but you're looking at Israel as it relates to the day of the Lord. And not the church, the body of Christ. The day of Christ is about the church. And it's not about Israel. The church is made up of Jews and Gentiles. It's made up of all races of mankind. The body of Christ knows no limits whatsoever. And anyone, for whosoever will, can come and take of the water of life freely. But the day of Christ is in view right now. And he said, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And he's going to exalt himself and show himself to be a God and sits in the temple of God professing to be God. He said, but that day's not going to overcome you. It's not, a take, it's not going to take you in darkness or in blindness. And so we're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at any moment. But when is he coming? Time and time and time and time again. They've written the books and made their prognostications and every last one of them have been wrong. We've got a lot of people saying today that the Lord Jesus has got to come in our lifetime. Because there's no way in this world that we can see what's happening in front of us and, and we can, there's no way we can ever get through this without the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'd say this, and I fully agree with you. In my estimation, everything that has to be done has been done, and there's no reason why he couldn't come right now. And as I said to you last Sunday morning, I picked out four or five different things to show you how that these are not the kind of things that are happening in every generation, that we've got stuff happening right now that has no counterpart in history, none. And it's happening right now. And I believe in my soul that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Amen. I believe it's near. But then it brings us back to the conditional thing. <laughs> you see what I mean? It could have been today, but then it might have been changed. Only the Father knows that hour and that day. And Satan is at a loss and will forever be to figure out when Christ is going to come. You've got to remember this. The Apostle Peter says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Amen. So, I mean, what's a thousand years to him? <laughs> For the one that liveth from everlasting to everlasting. Don't get discouraged if the Lord Jesus doesn't come back in a year or two. He is going to come back. Simeon and Anna were looking for the consolation of Israel. They were looking for the first advent of Christ. They were looking for the coming of the Lord. They were looking. And they were living in the temple nearby, praying day in and day out for the coming of the Lord. And he chose to come in their lifetime. The first advent. He can imagine all those that lived before, though. They lived out their lives, and they never saw him. He did not come in their lifetime. You've got to remember that. You've got to get hold of that from the Bible. He came when he chose to come at exactly the right moment, and he came. And so who knows what moment that is, and who knows when that is? Nobody knows it. And don't let somebody that gets arrogant and full of themselves get up and tell you that they know when the Lord's going to come back. They don't know when he's coming back. Amen. But I do know this. I do know he's coming, and as far as I can tell from what I see, I think it's near. I don't see any reason why. It, I mean, I've never seen anything like what's happening now. I mean, it's all gone. We're in free fall. The culture, in this, the culture in America is not slipping away. No, friend, it's in free fall. It is. It really is. And uh, I don't want to get political. If I get political, I get mad. <laughs> Stomp around, I swear, I'll tell you the truth. I can't believe. <laughs> I mean, some of the stuff these people are out here uh, preaching uh, uh, but uh, what they, what they, what the, what they, the America they want to see. Well, I'm going to tell you something about the America that some of them want to see. I wouldn't live in that America that some of them want to see. Hey, Amen. I wouldn't live in it. I wouldn't live. I'd live in a pig pen before I would in the America that some of these people want to see. I wish we could take it back 75 years. Hey, Amen. But in any event, this is one of the ways to study the Bible: is to understand that God's dealing with humanity all the way up until the present moment has been conditional in the mind of God 
that he chooses the time, the place to do what he intends to do, and no man stays his hand. And so that's where we are tonight. And I believe we are on the cusp of the second coming of Christ. Now, another thing in the Bible that needs to be understood is found in Hebrews chapter number 8 and verse number 10. This is one of the great things in Scripture that will help you understand the Bible. In Hebrews chapter number 8 and verse number 10, it says this. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Now, let's stop just a moment. Just a moment. Why would he not say this is the covenant that we'll make with the church after those days? You see, there are those who are preaching two covenants. My dear friend, there is only one blood covenant. There's only one blood covenant, and it is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross at Calvary. There is no other covenant because that covenant must be based on blood, and there's only one blood sacrifice. He offered one sacrifice for sins forever and has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. But look at the context of Hebrews 8. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Let's stop. So obviously the writer of the book of Hebrews is looking into the future, and he says there is a future for the house of Israel, right? I mean, how can you take it any other way? There's a future for the house of Israel. Now here's what he says, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Stop again. Has that happened? See, this is, this is, one, of the, this is, uh, this is one of the laws of exegesis, interpretation of the Scripture. Look at it and say to yourself, That hasn't happened. There has never been a time when everybody on this earth knew the Lord as the waters cover the sea. No. No, it has not happened. But there is coming a time when they will. Now look what he says. and Let's put it in context. And Pete, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now we've got two. And they're contrasted. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So what would that be? Well, in the context, it would be the old covenant. It's ready to vanish away. Don't ever let anybody drag you back under the law. But here's, this is the greater point in this, in Hebrews chapter number 8. That is that God is not finished with Israel. And if you go to the book of Romans chapter number 11, you'll find it there. Hath God cast away his people, which he foreknew? He makes it very plain. No. He says there is a remnant today, according to the election of grace. There's a remnant today. There will be certain Jews saved, and every generation always will be. Because for one reason, he says, my witness will be in Judah, as he did in the Old Testament. And it is. It's among the Jewish people. I, listened to a, I was listening to a Jewish girl today on YouTube giving her testimony how she got saved. Now, when I say Jewish, I'm talking about Israelite. She was speaking in Hebrew. But they gave, Engle, they gave an English caption at the bottom. I'm thankful. <laughs> I can pick out a Hebrew here and there, a little bit, word here, word there, but I cannot. Uh, there's no way in the world I could understand everything she said. Here's what she said. She says, we are taught from day one that the New Testament is full of lies, that, it, that, it, that its Hebrew is horrible, and that it, uh, and that it is, a, that is, is essentially just a piece of garbage. And so we never spend any time in the New Testament. They keep us out of the New Testament. Uh, essentially, they make us afraid of it. Okay? Now, this is what this Israelite girl who was born in Israel, speaking Hebrew, this is what she said. But then she said that one of her sisters got saved. And I think she had two sisters. One of them got saved. Somehow or another, a New Testament came into her hands. She began to read it on her own. What she did not realize when she was reading that New Testament, that's not a Gentile book. That's the Word of God. Amen. And it was not written by Gentiles. It was written by Jews. And the Mashiach, the Messiah of that New Testament, is not a Gentile. 
he's a Jew. And as she began to read that, she read that New Testament, and something started happening with her. And of course, we know why. The Word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive. She was reading a book, whether she thought whatever she thought had made any difference, it really didn't make any difference. I challenge any uh, theoretical physicist in the world, pick up the New Testament, read it for yourself. What, are you afraid of it? There's power in that book. It's alive. <laughs> and as she read it, it began to read her. And as she read it, it began to speak deeply in her. And as she read it, it began to open up something inside her that had never been opened before. And as she read it, the light came on. And it brought her to the point to where she started repenting. It brought her to a place of repentance because she began to believe what she was reading. And of course, you know what happened to her. She got saved. She got saved. All right. Now, I've told you before that a, a Jew will never reject Christ based on the Old Testament. You can't do it. The Old Testament will, you can take the Old Testament like Philip did the Ethiopian eunuch out there in the desert. He didn't have the New Testament. He had the Old Testament. He had the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. He led him to the Lord from the Old Testament. You see, he said to them, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. He said this to the Pharisees. He said, there are they that testify of me. What's he talking about? He's talking about Genesis through Malachi. All right? Not the Mishnah, not the Gemara, not the Midrash, not Halakha, not the Talmud, but the Bible. Because the Talmud blinds them. The Bible opens their eyes. See, there's the problem. And she got saved. And she's got a testimony. You can see the joy all over her face. Praise God. And I'm going to tell you something about the, that I've learned from Jews. Once one gets saved, you talk about loving the Bible. These people get into Scripture, and, they've, and they, I guess it's the gift that God gives them. They make excellent uh, exposition of the Word of God, and she did. And it's very good, and I'm so glad for it that God's Word opened her up. But you see, Romans chapter number 11 says, along with this book right here in Hebrews 8, they're blind right now. So what opens their eyes? The Holy Ghost and the Word of God. But they won't read it. And because of that, they stay blind. All right? They're blind. But here's the point of Hebrews chapter number 8. There's a new covenant. And who's that covenant with? The house of Israel. So how did we get in? Because we're not the house of Israel. This is another method of interpreting the Bible that is so important. The church does not replace Israel. That's called replacement theology. No, we do not replace Israel. Remember, remember the two conditional things I gave you how? That had Israel done what God intended for them to do, then they would have become the head of all the nations. Salvation would have been through the Jew as it was prophesied in the Old Testament. The Lord Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well, he says, you worship, you know not what? She said, we mount worship in this mountain, Mount Gerizim. He said, you don't know what you're worshiping. Salvation is of the who? He didn't say the church. He said the Jew. All right. It's of the Jew, and it still is, because they're the ones who wrote the Bible. But the church now was born, came into existence, and it's been here for 2,000 years. But the church does not replace the Jew. The covenant that was ratified at the death of Christ on the cross in other words, when it was brought into legal binding agreement, ratified, gave legal power, that covenant, when he shed his blood, that was brought there at Calvary 2,000 years ago, that covenant is waiting right now for the Jewish people. It's their covenant. We get the benefit of it because he called it a last will and testament in Hebrews 9. We, we have a testament. In other words, he bequeaths to us. He gives to us Gentile. He has to because we don't have a legal claim to anything. We can't lay legal claim to the house of David. We can't even lay legal claim to him being the Messiah. We Gentiles, we are without God, without hope, Paul said to that church. He said, you were lost without hope and darkness. You had no hope. 
And but the grace of God brought it to us, and he brought it to us through the Jew. How did he do it? Your Savior is a Jew. Your Bible was written by Jews. The first apostles that carried the word of God to the ends of the earth were Jews. The Jews were the ones that, that disseminated the scriptures, got it out into your hands, and you have it today because of them. Therefore, we are indebted greatly to them. And here they are. They're blinded. So now, when will they be saved? When will the Jew be saved? Let's go to Romans 11. Verse number 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Here we are. We're getting into the mysteries. That you should be wise in your own conceits. In other words, you read the 11th chapter of the book of Romans and you'll see that what was done was not done for the sake of the Gentiles. What was done to the Gentiles was done for the sake of the Jew to make them jealous. You ever thought about that? Now look at this lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the what? See this? Here's a conditional thing. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. I look at verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. How? When? As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Look at verse 27. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Is that a new covenant? Is that a different covenant? No, there's only one covenant. But then, then they get the benefit of it. Now look at this. As concerning the gospel, the grace of God that we preach, they are what? Enemies for your sakes. But it's touching the election. They are beloved for the Father's sake. Boy, think on that one. They are the enemy of the gospel that I preach, yet the Father loves them because they are the elect people. Now, that seems like a, a what would you call it? There's a word for that. Uh, uh, an enigma, it's an enigma in the sense that, but there's another word for it. I can't think of it right now. Uh, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For in time past have ye believed God, yet have now obtained, for as, in, for as ye in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded half of them in unbelief that he might have mercy on a few. That's the way it's preached. What's it say, though? For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Now look at Paul as he rejoices. Now look at this. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And he starts the 11th chapter by saying, I say then hath God cast away his people, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. He hath not cast away his people. The 10th chapter of the book of Romans in verse 1, the apostle says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And so he finishes the 11th chapter of the book of Romans by telling you how and when they're going to be saved. God answers his prayer. Now, if you get the Jew right, then you get a lot of other things right. But if you don't get them right, 
uh, you know, and Protestantism, uh, for the most part, uh, never did get it right because they preach and teach a replacement theology. You've got amillennial, premillennial, and uh, uh, postmillennial. Uh, the millennial means the millennium. Uh, the millennium in, is, a, is a, I think it's a Latin word, mill annum, thousand years. A thousand years, Christ is going to reign on this earth. If you believe that, you believe he's going to reign for a thousand years on this earth, then you're premillennial because you are before that period of time. You're waiting for it. If you think that the millennium represents a spiritual period of time that is non, non you know, there's no real, it's not bound by a thousand years, uh, and that you believe that the world is going, to, is going to essentially be saved by the preaching of the gospel. And a lot of people in the 1800s began to believe that. They really did. They were post-millennial. They thought the earth was about to enter a new stage of birth until World War I showed up. And when World War I showed up, it shook a lot of them into reality because that was a horrible, horrible war. And there was no way that through all the preaching and the ministry and all that the church had done, what had it done as far as converting the world? Postmillennialism believes that the millennium will come by the church preaching the gospel and the world will get saved and it'll be converted and therefore a, a non-distinct period of time, it'll enjoy a spiritual millennium and then at the end of that spiritual millennium, the Lord is going to come back. That's post-millennial. millennial means no millennium. And major Protestant denominations have been preaching this for decades. And they teach that no millennium means that essentially the church is here to make life better for people, you know, to take care of the social problems and the social ills of the world. And, and that we're here to help people. And we are to do all these all good things, certainly good things. But the first, first primary purpose of us is to preach the gospel. But all means no millennium, and you see. And so therefore, these people essentially say the millennium means nothing that we find in the book of Revelation. Now, I know that's an oversimplification because there are differences and variations in all three of them. But I'm premillennial, and that means that I believe that the earth, evil men and seducers, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, the world, the world is not getting better right now. They're talking about World War III. They're talking about Iran, about to strike Israel. And, uh, and you know, something could happen, and, and they could have a regional war, and a regional war could expand into possibly a world war. I pray that doesn't happen. But in any event, it could happen. And the Lord Jesus said in the book of Revelation, except those days should be shortened, he said in Matthew 24, rather, except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be left alive. So here we are tonight. I'm premillennial. Can I have fellowship with an amillennial? Well, sure I can. I can have fellowship with any man or woman who believes in the deity of Christ, who's been born again. They love the Lord. They don't always agree. I had a man stand up here Sunday morning. He stood right here and he talked to me and he came up, real nice fellow. He says, we don't agree with, in eschatology. Well, I knew exactly what he was talking about. Eschatology, from the Greek word eschatos, it means last things. So eschatology has to do with the doctrine of last things, which has to do with premillennial, amillennial, or postmillennial. And he didn't elaborate on which one he believed, but that's if he's born again, I can fellowship with him. I can fellowship with him. And Christians should be able to do that. They should have enough maturity about them to do that because people see things differently. I'm not up here demanding that you see the Scripture exactly as I do. What I would ask that you do is read it, study it, and for yourself know why you believe what you believe. That's what's important. So I know I've rambled on here for quite a while tonight with you, but I just wanted you to understand that uh, there's a reason why the world is in the shape it's in tonight. You say the church failed to convert the world. No, it didn't. We were never told to convert the world. He said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what he told us to do. But there's not a word in that Bible that says we're going to convert the world. The problem in America is the world's converted church. Amen. That's the sad thing about it. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. How many of you know Todd Bacon? You know Todd? I just found out today his wife just passed away at the end of June. 
She was 60 years old, and from what little I know, it was sudden. So I don't know any more than that. But please pray for Todd tonight, because he's lost his he's lost his wife, and it's a, it's a hard thing. She was 60 years old, and uh, she's gone on to be with the Lord now. So please pray for that family. You know her daughter Sarah came here, grew up here at Temple. Sarah, remember her. Pray for her and pray for that family. Todd Bacon, pray for Todd. Does anybody have a request tonight? Yes, ma'am. Good. I'm good. Good. All right. Anybody else? There is a young lady that's 32 years old. Her name's Katrina, or I'm sorry, Katarina. Um, she has a terminal illness, is in, has just been given a few years left to live. Um, she has spinal fluid coming through her nose. Um, they did a spinal tap on her today. Um, she has a, a lot of swelling on her brain, and she's just in major pain. Um, so if you guys could keep her in your prayers, please. Amen. All right. Anybody else? I talked with uh, Tanya Hall today, and she asked us to please pray for her family down there. They've got 11 inches of rain, and the eye of the storm is supposed to hit early in the morning. And also, she is having foot surgery next Tuesday. She asked the church to please remember her in prayer. Hey, Amen. She's under the gun, folks. That hurricane uh, is moving up uh, through, uh, uh, what's it, Myrtle Beach in that area. All right, anybody else? It's over here. Ask the church to pray for my mom. Her big toe's swollen up about twice the size as it should be. They say it's bone spurs. She said it's about to kill her. And her lymph nodes in her neck, she said are swollen and really bothering her. She got a doctor's point tomorrow. Okay, brother. All right. Buddy, down here in the front, Shelly. One of our sisters in Christ on live streaming, her name is Sister Shay, S-H-A-E. Anyway, she had asked me to uh, pray for her. She's having some tests done this week, and she wanted the church to pray for her, and I told her I would. All right. Amen. Okay. Anybody else? I'd like you to remember to pray for Israel. And, uh, yes. you know, for that country being so small and then being surrounded by their enemies, you know, we need to keep them in prayer. And I really admire the President Netanyahu and, and the troops that they got to wake up every day yeah. and they put their faith in God, you know, and uh, I pray that our country stands with them. Uh, I know that God loves them. And I believe that, you know, uh, I enjoyed the message today. Thank you. All right, brother. Amen. All right. Anybody else? I think somebody. Sister Hobbs back there in the corner. <clears throat> um, I would just ask the church to pray for the American troops that are over there in Iraq. You know, our son got back from there back in June. And they got um, replaced. He's part of the 82nd Airborne, but they got replaced by a battalion. I think they're from Fort Drum, and there was some of them that were injured just recently from yes, an attack. They were, so yeah. just keep those soldiers yeah. in your prayers. Thank you. Yeah. That's my understanding. You're firing rockets into Iraq. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? had a, a 
couple visit a, a few months ago from North Carolina, and I've been keeping in contact with her, and she's made a request for a friend of hers named Gloria is having some health issues. She'd like the church to pray for her. All right. Yes, ma'am. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, have unspoken requests? I do. God knows I've got two or three in my family. The Lord knows what they are. And I want you to pray for us, please. All right. Brother Chapman, lead us in prayer, please. Yes. Yes. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Yes, ma'am. good.
Good. That's good. All right. That's good. All right. And we'll see you, Lord Welding, Sunday. God bless you.